Hey guys, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we are going to be tackling a big topic, weight loss surgery. So we're going to be talking about some of the common types of bariatric surgery, some of the motivators or outcomes of surgery, and most importantly, the significant risks associated with some of these procedures. Now, I want to flag that this video is not meant to be a promotion for or a lecture against bariatric surgery. I fully respect your body autonomy, and I am definitely going to be keeping my bias out of this to simply state what some of the evidence says, so that way you can make some informed decisions about your life. I believe that we are so lucky to have options when it comes to our health, but it's still really important to understand all of these options from all sides. I totally understand that this content may be triggering for some of my viewers. So if this is the kind of content that maybe you want to skip ahead on or you don't want to watch, don't worry, there's lots of great content on the way. Also, of course, I want to remind you that my merch line is now available. This is my favorite snack sweatshirt. So I think just really fun and cheeky and it's great for hanging out in. So you can definitely check out the link uh, in the description below, but also just check out the shop page on my website. Before we dive in, just as a reminder, the information in this video is for entertainment and educational purposes only, and you should always seek out the help of a registered dietitian and your doctor for your unique case. Okay, so let's get into this. First of all, what is weight loss surgery, aka bariatric surgery? It ultimately involves making changes to the digestive system to, of course, aid in weight loss. So bariatric surgery generally achieves weight loss in two major ways. Number one is through restriction. So in some types of procedures, the surgeon decreases the size of the stomach to limit the amount of food that it can hold. So common procedures that achieve restriction are things like laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, aka the lap band, as well as sleeve gastrectomy. Number two is malabsorption. Now, in this type of bariatric surgery procedure, the surgeon limits the amount of nutrients that the body absorbs by bypassing a part of the small intestine. So common procedures that achieve malabsorption are the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass and the biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch, also known as the duodenal switch. So now let's talk a bit about some of the potential motivators and outcomes of weight loss surgery. The first being, of course, weight loss. Now, considering its main purpose is, of course, to help people reduce their weight when they haven't had success with other avenues, research has consistently shown that bariatric surgery is effective at helping patients lose between 47 to 70 percent of their excess weight. Having said that, research has also found that bariatric surgery doesn't promise long-term results necessarily. One study found that excess weight loss in patients with the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, for example, was 77% after a year. It then decreased to 56% after five years. Now, other research has found that weight regain weight was around 14.1% in five years after weight loss surgery, while another study found that only 40% of gastric bypass patients maintained at least 30% of their weight loss after 12 years. These numbers may be more promising than lifestyle ventures alone. However, given the physical and mental cost associated with bariatric surgery, it's not necessarily a foolproof one and done procedure either. Number two is improvements in glycemic control. One study by Bushwald et al. found that bariatric surgery achieved complete diabetes resolution in 76.8% of its subjects. However, long-term data shows a potential recurrence of hyperglycemia for some patients years after the procedure. While it's unclear how many patients will relapse because of a lack of long-term studies, research does suggest that there is a significant percentage, somewhere between 30 and 50%, um, of patients who will likely experience a relapse in their diabetes symptoms. Next is a decrease in mortality. One meta-analysis including over 44,000 participants from eight different trials found a reduced risk of global mortality after bariatric surgery compared with no surgery. Research has also shown that weight loss surgery can reduce mortality in specific people and populations by as much as 30%. So not surprisingly, bariatric surgery may be a promising option for some individuals, but it certainly is not perfect and is not without its risks. Now let's shift gears for a second and discuss some of the long-term concerns of weight loss surgeries, starting with common physical health concerns. Number one, malnutrition and malabsorption. 
Now, depending on the procedure, some weight loss surgeries completely bypass a large portion of the small intestine, making it almost impossible for your gut to absorb all of the vitamins and minerals from food and increasing the risk of malnutrition. So one study, for example, found an iron deficiency incidence of up to 50% in premenopausal women who had had gastric bypass surgery, but not in the restrictive procedure group. Likewise, protein deficiency has been reported in about 7 to 21% of patients after undergoing the duodenal switch procedure because of the alteration in bilary and pancreatic function. Electrolyte imbalance is another major complication of bariatric surgery, and that can result in neuromuscular disorders and arrhythmias of the heart. Because of these risks, lifelong monitoring of these nutritional complications is definitely necessary to avoid any long-term issues. Number two, serious GI disorders. So nausea and vomiting are very common outcomes of weight loss surgery. Sometimes this is because of overeating or eating certain foods that are not compatible with your new digestive tract and function and size. Um, but dumping syndrome, which is basically when foods enter the small intestine too quickly, can also cause nausea, as well as vomiting, diarrhea, and dizziness. So for that reason, patients are instructed to really focus on keeping their portion sizes small and of course eating very mindfully and slowly. Number three, relapse rates. Now considering the risks and lifestyle shift that is required in bariatric surgery, nobody wants to believe that weight regain or diabetes relapse is a common experience. But as I mentioned earlier, these things do commonly happen. Now, even with these relapses, the outcomes may arguably still be potentially better than they might have been with strict dieting alone for some individuals. But still, I think it's important to just note that weight loss surgery is not necessarily a fix it and forget it kind of procedure for a lot of patients. Now, maybe more concerning, let's talk about the mental health risks. Starting with an increased risk for eating disorders. The incidence of binge eating disorder has been estimated to be as high as 69% in bariatric patients, and night eating syndrome is present in as many as 42%. These numbers are truly shocking. While many patients report vomiting after eating as a result of overeating or not being able to tolerate the food with their new GI system, there's also a percentage of patients that are vomiting to ultimately control their weight and or shape. Some researchers have suggested that the common gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting that are just ultimately common after weight loss surgery may almost help facilitate or perpetuate the development of eating disorder behaviors. It can be very difficult to classify certain behaviors as disordered because ultimately some behaviors are kind of taught and encouraged after bariatric surgery as a way to relieve discomfort. Number two, addiction transfer. Researchers have found that patients are more prone to alcohol abuse, and this type of addiction may be happening as a way to substitute eating. This is known as addiction transfer. Since a bariatric patient cannot really use food anymore as a coping mechanism, they instead may turn to drugs and or alcohol to comfort them. In a 2015 study, 18.4% of patients developed an alcohol abuse disorder within three years of having the RYGB surgery. Some researchers hypothesize that alcohol abuse is common among bariatric patients because of the structural changes made to the digestive system. Those changes make alcohol more easily absorbed, which is why patients have a greater response to the effects of alcohol. In one study, 84% of patients who consumed alcohol after bariatric surgery experienced intoxicating effects after consuming even a very small amount. Next, let's talk about depression, suicide, and overall mental health. A lot of the time before surgery even takes place, bariatric candidates already have a history of depression or other mental illnesses. They've likely been exposed to bullying and fat shaming, leading to disordered eating and or substance abuse. According to a study from Yale University, about 13% of bariatric surgery patients experience an increase in depression after surgery. In a large 2016 study, researchers found that patients who had undergone the RYGB surgery were three times more likely to attempt suicide than the general population. And when compared to the World Health Organization's suicide rates for the general population, researchers found a four-fold increased risk of death by suicide among bariatric surgery patients. To give us some greater insight on weight loss surgeries, I've invited Kirsten Ackerman to chat with us. 
Kirsten is a registered dietitian that specializes in health at every size and intuitive eating. She also has an amazing podcast that I definitely recommend called Intuitive Bites. So I'm going to link to that in the description below. Now, Kirsten actually worked in a bariatric clinic for a few years and has gotten some really amazing insights to share. Well, hi, Kirsten. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you. As someone who has worked in a bariatric clinic, why do you believe that there's such high rates of things like depression and suicide and disordered eating in a lot of the patients? So much weight stigma in the medical system. I mean, they're, they're the ones that are most highly impacted by this. Um, so that's like one massive thing. Many of these people do have disordered eating prior, prior to going forward with surgery. You know, the mental health assessment that's being done, yes, it's, it's screening for eating disorders, but I, from my experience, many disordered eating behaviors are slipping through, right? Mm -hmm. because, partly because they're so normalized in our culture that they're like, oh yeah, of course, you're in a larger body and you're, you know, engaging in these disordered behaviors. Um, so that, so of course that's going to carry on to after surgery. Uh, but things like suicide and, and also like turning to other substances, mm -hmm. right? Becoming addicted to other substances after surgery is common because you're taking away something that may have been a coping skill for some of these people, which is food. Um, and then you're just kind of, you're, they're not allowed, they can't really use that in the same way, so they turn to other things, and things like depression or suicidal ideation just kind of bubble to the surface. Right, really interesting insights, and, and absolutely, I think that's what the evidence also has really been showing. So with your learning of haze and intuitive eating, how has your view of weight loss surgeries changed? Yeah, so I very strongly now believe that other routes should be explored prior to surgery. Um, I think that, you know, my view overall of the surgery is that the industry, the weight loss surgery industry is so embedded in the fat is bad, fat is inherently unhealthy narrative, um, and that weight loss at all costs is the right thing, um, that I just, I have so many issues with the industry. Um, I wanna be really careful here, here not to attack the individual, because there's many reasons that individuals might pursue this, um, and that's not their fault. But as the industry, as far as the industry goes, and just like with its roots and its overall approach, I think it's really problematic. Um, I do think other avenues should be explored before surgery. The problem is I think that the way that our culture currently would take that statement is that people should try to lose weight through all these different avenues with different diets or what other, whatever mechanism. And from the health at every size perspective, from my approach, I would say that we need to stop trying to force larger body people into smaller bodies and rather take the approach of how can I best support their health, their nutrition, their nourishment, their you know engagement and joyful movement and allow their body to do with that what it will. It may result in weight loss, it may not, but we can support them and make them healthier mm -hmm. um, by taking these other approaches. Amazing. Obviously, this video is not meant to shame any individual for choosing bariatric surgery, um, but to ultimately just in, inform them of some of those risks and, and some of the outcomes. So in your experience, for patients who have chosen to embark on this journey, what are some ways to potentially help minimize some of these risks that we talked about, both physical, but also a lot of the mental health risks that we mentioned, the suicide, depression, eating disorders, etc.? Yeah, so I think that it is so important that people who are going through this process, first of all, have support from in their social lives, like from their mm -hmm. family, um, but also even more importantly, have the support of a therapist and hopefully a weight inclusive dietitian who's you know um, going to really support their their nourishment after surgery. Uh, but having you know a dietitian, a therapist, especially you know a therapist that's going to help them through maybe some of the issues they had around disorder, disordered eating prior to surgery, help them to understand the impact of the weight stigma that they likely experienced, right? Because they're existing in our culture in a larger body um, and really just have that support as they're navigating the really, really intense post-op phase. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's that those are some really great observations. Okay, so now let's talk about intuitive eating post-surgery. This is the big question. 
is it possible for people to have an intuitive eating lifestyle after undergoing you know, one of these surgeries? And how can you incorporate some or all of the principles into your life post-surgery? Yeah, so short answer is absolutely yes. You can have, you know, you can go on this intuitive eating journey and reconnect to your body after surgery, but it is different than if you hadn't gone through surgery. Um, so certain principles like, you know, honoring your hunger and feeling your fullness are much different after surgery because your body is either, like many people experience, not having hunger signals right okay. after surgery. For many people, it comes back in time, and that is actually very normal. Um, but in the beginning, if you, you know, kind of take the principle as honoring your hunger and like from the perspective of, oh, I should only eat when I'm hungry, then, you know, that's going to be problematic. Um, but looking at it in a nuanced way of like, oh, okay, I'm going to honor my hunger when it's there, sure, because my body deserves that. And also, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, practicing nourishment for self-care, even if the hunger isn't present. Right. Um, and then feeling fullness can be really different after surgery as well because it can come in it, honestly it can be a really traumatic experience for people after mm -hmm. surgery because they might take one bite of, bite of something and have a really negative response to it and then the next time they eat it it's fine so it, it can just be really scary honestly right. but um i think taking it from the lens of listening to your body taking your body's feedback and trying to understand it so that the next time you nourish it you know you can try to take that feedback and you know eat in a way that's hopefully um, going to be feeling okay for you so it's it's really just this awareness and this using the feedback from your body to inform your future decisions around food yeah, I, I can. I, I think that's some great advice. So thank you so much for that, Kirsten. I, your your insight into this world is so valuable because you've you know you've seen it from both sides. So it's really so interesting to to hear your perspective. Of course, thank you. So um, thank you again, Kirsten. You definitely need to check out her podcast. Um, I have personally learned so much from your podcast. And for those of you that are on your intuitive eating journeys, I think it will absolutely help so, so much. So thank you again for joining me, Kirsten. Thank you, Abby. Have a great day. Bottom line, bariatric surgery may have significant health benefits for some individuals. I am always happy that we have a wide range of medical procedures and options to suit a wide variety of individuals' needs. But it's also important to know that it is not necessarily a magic pill and is not without any risks. Weight loss surgery is ultimately a stomach surgery, not a brain surgery. So if the underlying health concerns related to eating and food are not well addressed before surgery, the risks very well may outweigh the benefits of a smaller body. Again, this video is meant to inform and support your journey, not ever to shame or belittle anyone for their health and wellness choices. So please help me keep the comment section kind and respectful. Now, if you found this information enlightening, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Leave me a comment below if you have any further questions about these types of surgeries or really anything nutrition related that you'd like a video on. Subscribe to the channel, don't forget that. And I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.